Hello and welcome back to A Splash of Paint, where it's time for us to rejoin today's special guest, Jeff Kersey, as he adds the final finishing touches to today's watercolour landscape painting. Thanks, Matthew. Well, earlier on, you saw me put this background in quite loosely with wet into wet washers, and I've now removed the masking fluid, and I've mixed some colour for this ruin here, this ruined mill. And it's some raw sienna and burnt sienna. Gives us a nice bright orangey colour, which is a good contrast with the greens behind it. And I'm just working to this shape. I've got a number eight brush, which is a fairly large brush, but it's got a really good fine point to it so I can be accurate about where I'm putting the paint. Because I have got to stick to this shape that's been revealed by the masking fluid. Now I've left the masking fluid on the tree here so that I can paint right across it without smudging it. Okay, now that's, that's like the base colour, the background colour, but it looks a bit flat, so I think I need to put a few other colours in to give it a bit of texture. Remember, it's not a new building, it's a bit weathered. Um, I've got some cerulean blue and uh, violet, manganese violet there, gives us a, a grey. In fact, it goes greyer when it gets in with the orange on the paper, which I think works well. It's often interesting to let your colours actually mix on the paper, see what you get. Okay, um, maybe a little bit of that dark green. This is the viridian and manganese violet to get the colour of the building a bit darker near the ground, which suggests a bit of damp creeping up the walls. And perhaps a little more burnt sienna into that mixture of raw sienna and burnt sienna to give us a hint of red, which should give us a a hint of reflected light. So now I've put those colours in, I can get straight onto the middle distance and foreground. I, I want some really bright colour again to contrast with the background. So I'm going to mix a little more lemon yellow and a little more bright green. That was aureolin and cobalt blue. And let's start with the lemon yellow to get a nice bright colour right next to that dark green. Now where the building is, I want the colour to uh, seep up into the stonework to look like lichen or moss around the base of the building. I'm still carrying on with that lemon yellow across there. Now that lemon yellow is a nice contrast with the, the greens behind it, but it's a bit powerful, so I'm now going to get some of the bright green uh, and just use that to calm it down a bit. You can see there where I've had the masking fluid to the left and to the right of the building that I've got a sort of feathered edge in white paper. You achieve that by putting the masking fluid on to a wet background so that rather than getting a hard edge with masking fluid you get a soft edge. I've now got some more of the building colour. That's the raw sienna and burnt sienna because the ground is, isn't all grass the sort of gravel across here, and I'm bringing that right down to the foreground. And then I'm going to get some cobalt blue and rose madder, just like the colour I had in the sky at the beginning. Maybe a little bit more rose madder in it this time, so it's a bit redder, and bring that across the foreground as well. And that makes a nice grey colour when it mixes in with that orangey colour. Maybe a bit bluer, let's get it a little bit stronger to bring the foreground forward, I've added a touch more cobalt blue to the mixture. And then I'm going to swap to a smaller brush. I've got a number four. And I'm going to suggest a few grasses and weeds around the base of this tree. First with a bit of lemon yellow, a bit of bright green. That's the aureolin and cobalt blue. Let's make it a bit bluer. I've added a bit more blue to it, darken it slightly. Maybe a little bit of that dark green, that's the viridian and manganese violet, maybe a little bit of that around the base of the tree. I'm going to get a little bit of neat lemon yellow and mix it with some neat Naples yellow. That makes a very opaque colour and just put a little suggestion of leaves in the background there, partly obscuring your view of the tree trunks. Just a few touches of that. So 
So I'm just going to mix some more colours. I need a nice shadow colour for the ruined building. So I'm going to get some more of the cobalt blue and rose madder, deliberately making the shadow match that glimpse of colour in the top of the sky. And then for that little window in the building, I need a real rich dark brown. I'm going to take some burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. So that's my colours mixed. I'm just going to remove the masking fluid from this big tree. I have to have a dry background before I can do that. And then I'm starting with the shadow colour on the right hand side of the building. I want a nice sharp edge where the shadow meets the light. It's important that the shadow is transparent. You've got to feel as though you can see that warm orangey colour of the stonework underneath it. But I'm making it a little bit lighter away from the corner so that we really emphasise that corner. That makes the shadow stronger, nearer to the light part. And just a little bit of grass and stuff around the bottom of it, a bit of lemon yellow. Okay, now with, this, with the smaller brush, a number four brush, I'm just going to mix the orange with the grey to give me a colour for a little bit of stonework. So it doesn't look too neat and tidy, too perfect. And we've got this little window here, or opening in the wall. That's what I've got the really dark mixture of burnt sienna and ultramarine blue for. And I've got a very fine number two detailer brush to put this in. Okay. Maybe a, a little bit of shadow to the left of there for that, for these stones on top. Okay, and we'll Take the number four brush again. A bit more lemon, maybe a little bit of detail around the base of the tree in the foreground. Now the light's coming from the left, so I'm just mixing a touch more shadow, cobalt blue, and rose madder again and let's imagine there's some trees or foliage whatever really we can't see it from outside of the, on the left hand side of the picture casting a bit of shadow into the scene so the final thing to do is to put this large tree in on the right so i've got a number 10 brush and a mixture of raw sienna and burnt sienna now it's anything but just plain brown this there's a lot of colors going on in this tree there's a bit of purpley blue that I can see in it. And that's, I'm going back to that mixture of cerulean blue and manganese violet. And let's put that along the shadow side of the tree. It goes slightly green when it gets in with that orangey yellow, but that's okay, because you do get lichen and moss climbing up trees, so it doesn't look out of place. Putting a bit of cerulean blue into the mixture keeping the darker side of the tree over to that right hand side of it okay and then while it's still wet i want to really emphasize the dark side of the trunk with some of that rich mixture of burnt sienna and ultramarine blue and you have to try and get this in it's a bit dark that i'm going to add a bit more burnt sienna to it so it's not quite as black as that better and you have to get this color in while the trunk is still damp so that it softens and looks cylindrical looks rounded what you've got to avoid is getting stripes on it now i can take this area here take the dark there and make that into a, a branch stretching across there 
Most of the branches, though, are up in the, the top out of the picture from a large tree like this. But we don't see most of them. Uh, and I'm just going to take a damp, clean brush and encourage those colours to blend a bit in the middle so that it does look rounded. This tree has got to be cast in a shadow off to the right there, across there, which I'm going to soften into the ground. And maybe just a bit more work around the base of the tree to sit with some neat lemon yellow to suggest some grasses and weeds and things and just sort of blend the tree into the ground a bit. A bit more green. And I think that building, there's just a finishing touch, I think that building needs a little more detail. So I've got a few more marks to make with this grey. And this grey is a mixture of cobalt blue and rose madder and the raw sienna and burnt sienna, the orange colour. It gives us a sort of grey colour. Bit of shadow in that opening there. Perhaps a little more work around the base to suggest weeds and grasses and things like that. Well, I think we'll have a little bit of foliage overhanging the building to make it look like nature's claiming it back. And I've got that opaque mixture again. Uh, fairly neat paint and it's lemon yellow and Naples yellow and I'm going to use the side of the brush like that and bring some of these leaf shapes across in front of the building. Whilst it's called dry brush work this technique the brush of course isn't totally dry but the point is it's not too wet the paint doesn't come flooding off it so it just sticks to the paper and gives us that hit and miss effect and I'm going to finish off with a, uh, the liner writer brush again and the opaque lemon yellow and Naples yellow again and just bring out a few leaves against the tree trunk there little just a touch more suggestion of foliage and leaves in front of this tree So we'll call that finished. So there's our finished picture. I hope you've enjoyed watching and I'll see you next time. Great guidance there, Jeff. I hope today's project has inspired you to have a go at creating your own stunning landscape scenes, whatever your artistic ability. Now let's take a quick look to see how SAA professional artist Terry Chip keeps his mixed acrylic paints moist and fresh. So let's have a look at how to use a SAA Keep Wet palette. First thing, you get the lid, which is very important. And inside there, there are two sheets of paper, special papers. The top sheet is a membrane, which allows water to pass through it. And the bottom sheet is a Keep Wet sheet, which you have to damp at the start. I usually just pour water in, swirl it around and pour the water out again. Lay the membrane on top. You may find when you first do that, it starts to curl up as the water starts to affect it. It's only temporary. Perhaps just hold it down with a few, you know, something to hand, tube of paint, while you can squeeze some more paint out. Once your paint's out, the weight of the paint will hold it flat. Not a problem. That moisture in the sheet underneath seeps through the membrane and keeps the acrylic moist and workable for as long as you need it, really. If you're working all day on this, and then you come to the end of the day, you've still got some colours mixed up, you want to come back to the following day, no problem. Put the lid on top, and it's a tight-fitting, airtight lid that will keep those paints moist in there for a couple of days. If you know you're going to leave it longer, perhaps for a week, just take a piece of tissue, damp it, and tuck it in a corner. It keeps a damp atmosphere and the acrylics will keep moist for well over a week. Remember, if you're looking for specialist information or advice on any art products or supplies available to help you on your artistic journey, visit the saa.co.uk website. Well, folks, time for our final break now, but join us in part four where we'll delve into the SAA library 
to look through another inspirational title with our regular bookworm, Henry Malt. And I'll be answering a few more questions from the Splash of Paint postbag. See you soon.